Hi everyone and welcome to video 4.1.8 for the Legal Studies Guy. Um, our quote today from Og Mandino, Augustine Mandino, um, American self-help author, um, wrote a bunch of books telling you to be good at things. Um, but I don't mind this one, always do your best. Um, so that constant theme of, you know, put your best foot forward. Um, like last video, don't be afraid of losing, you know, go for the win. What you plant now, you will harvest later. So always do your best every moment. Do the work early. So particularly as we're talking maybe holidays time or if this is revision, not waiting until the last minute, um, planting the seeds now so that when the time to perform comes, which will be that exam at the end of the year or your next sack, you will get that harvest. So today, 4.1.8, and we've just come off, we're into lawmaking by the courts now, and we've just come off 4.1.7, which is statutory interpretation, and today we're going to talk about precedent. Um, there's a few aspects of this we're going to talk about broadly. We'll touch again on the idea of lawmaking by the courts, um, so a little bit of that, I guess, history of that. Um, we'll touch on what binding and persuasive precedent are, and then we'll talk about reversing, overruling, distinguishing, and disapproving, or as it's often known, rod um, around precedent. We'll touch on this skill. There'll be a little bit of that relationship between courts and parliament, but we'll touch again on that discuss skill and everything that comes below it. Um, and hopefully, yeah, at the end of this, you'll be able to talk to, you know, someone else in your class, explain to your teacher, obviously answering questions on a sack. Um, it's a really, really good one to try and, you know, explain to someone like your parents to show that you do understand this stuff. Teaching others is a really great study skill. What role do courts play in lawmaking and how does precedent operate? So, look, if you really want a great um, – or if you – want a full unpacking of this slide here, I'd recommend jumping back to the 4.1.7 video. Um, but again, just reiterating that the primary role of courts is to resolve disputes. And as part of that, the secondary role that they can perform is to make law. So first and foremost, courts exist to resolve disputes. And a secondary aspect of that is that sometimes, so they are always resolving disputes, and sometimes as part of that, a small little subsection of it, they will make law as part of that process. We talked in the last video about the difference between common law and statute law, um, and statutory interpretation is an aspect of that statute law. But this just unpacks it in a little bit more detail. So the two types of law are common law and statute law. Common law, as we said, is judge-made law or case law, so law that comes from cases, law that comes from judges as opposed to acts of parliament or law that's, that come from parliament. And I've included in the links later on a nice little overview of the history of the judiciary, the history of um, common law and courts and judges from England. But common law originated in England. We adopted our system of law as we were colonies, six separate colonies of um, the British Empire. When we federated as a nation, we adopted the British um, legal system. And up until I think it was the 70s, um, you could still, like the highest court of appeal in Australia was still the Privy Council um, in England. Um, so we were still in a way under the British legal system. And we adapted the common law, adopted, sorry, not adapted, didn't change it. We adopted the common law from England um, until we were over time able to develop our own body of law. Um, and this common law is that the decision of judges in cases are written down and then followed in future cases. And in the overview um, thing later on, uh, or the link that I'll give you later on that you can go and read. It talks about the history of this, and it goes back to, you know, the 1100s, like we're talking 12th century, 11, I think it's like 1166, when for the first time it was one of the, who knows which number, it was like King Henry something. And he basically, you know, up until then, that's a very poor map of England, um, up until then, Every, every little section of England had their own little, I guess, local courts and local lords made all the decisions. And it was back in around about this time that King Henry from his base in London, um, or I assume London, he started sending judges out from London to all of the different areas. 
um, that are now called circuits, and we still call them circuits. You know, um, the county court goes out on circuit around Victoria, for example. Um, and the judges went out on circuit and they went around and they started resolving um, cases and writing down the decisions that they made. And then they would bring that back um, to London and they would make sure that basically they would develop this big body of law. And there were obviously a set of judges in London who were also resolving cases and, and basically deciding what the law would be. And over time, you came up with what became a national body of law or a common law that everyone was following as opposed to individual different local laws. So that's where the term common law comes from because it went from being different in every little part of England to being common across the entirety of the country um, and eventually the empire. So this is where the concept of common law comes from. And these judges were going out, writing down their decisions, bringing them back, and that develops the body of law so that the same decisions are being made over and over in different cases, but also the same decisions are being made in the top of the country as are being made in the bottom so that there's that ongoing consistency. Obviously, this has developed a lot over time. Um, and a really big aspect of that, I guess, is that at the top, above all the judges, was the king. And ultimately, if the king didn't like a decision that a judge had made, if a king didn't like a law, a common law that a judge had established, the king could then overrule them. And these days, we don't have a king overruling us. We have a parliament. And this is where statute law comes into it now. And that is those acts of parliament which are superior to common law. Um, Parliament makes those statutes and then they're given meaning or interpreted by the courts. So common law comes from the decisions in cases, the decisions of judges, and the idea is that it's common and unified for everyone based on those decisions. But then Parliament, in the tradition of the kings um, or, or queens of the British Empire, Parliament can then come over the top with their own law. And we're going to focus on this idea of precedent today, um, which exists a lot in this space. So what is precedent? So the decisions made by judges creates precedent. Um, and you might have heard the saying, you might have heard the word precedent used before in sayings. Um, you know, you often hear it termed like, oh, that sets a dangerous precedent. You might hear your teacher say, oh, well, if I let you go to the toilet, I'm setting a dangerous precedent because that's the idea that then they have to let everyone go to the toilet. If I let you eat in class, I set a dangerous precedent. If I let you use your laptop, I set a dangerous precedent. The idea being that precedent is something that you have to continue to then do in the future. So what we, some common or important Latin terms we'll need to know here are this concept of ratio decidendi. So the reasons for the decision. So why a judge, exactly why a judge made a decision. And judges have to explain this. Remember, they write down all the decisions. Why a judge made a decision is the ratio decidendi. And that establishes a principle that is followed in future cases by future courts, be it the same court or others. This is what precedent is. Precedent comes from the reasons for the decision. So the reasons for the decision of a court must be followed or should be followed in future cases. We split this into two categories, and you'll note that the study design is very clear that we need to know the difference between binding precedent and persuasive precedent. And these are precedents that must be followed. So binding equals must be followed versus persuasive precedent, which is influential. And in a way, you could argue should, where possible, be followed to allow for consistency and predictability, but does not have to be followed. It doesn't, um, it isn't a must. It's important to note that binding precedent comes from higher courts. So it's important that we understand, thinking back to area 3.1 and 3.2, that we understand our court hierarchy in um, Victoria and then more broadly Australia. So the Magistrates Court, the County Court, the Supreme Court, and then the Court of Appeal, and then the High Court above it. Um, 
also some federal courts, you know, full bench of the family court versus just the family court, full court, full bench of the federal court um, versus the federal court. Um, also, not as necessary that we know. We are focused on the Victorian system. Um, but, yeah, we need to remember that binding must be followed works in a top-down approach. So binding precedent comes from high in the hierarchy and down, and decisions from higher courts must be followed in lower courts within their jurisdiction. So decisions by higher courts, a decision by the Court of Appeal, um, must then be followed in future similar cases in the county court, for example. A decision of the Supreme Court must be followed in the Magistrates Court. This is really important to note, um, and that is fundamentally the difference between binding and persuasive precedent. When can judges make or develop precedent? Well, if the case, like I spoke about when we talked about um, the development of common law, if a case involves an entirely new issue that there is no statute, there is no existing precedent, the decision will therefore create a precedent. Um, precedent in terms of binding precedent can only be created by superior courts of record. Um, but obviously the decision, you know, made initially in the magistrate's court, say that's appealed to the um, county court or Supreme Court at the point of law, that is in a way going to, that decision is going to be persuasive or influential on that higher court. So precedents are made or developed in cases involving a new issue that's not covered by an existing law. If it is a case interpreting a statute that hasn't previously been interpreted, so that statutory interpretation stuff, when we know one effect of statutory interpretation is it creates a precedent, um, you know, future cases around the Control of Weapons Act, um, a studded belt can't be a regulated weapon. So that statute was being interpreted for the first time, that decision created a precedent that was then binding on lower courts, or when a lower court, judges have the ability to make or develop precedent, and we say develop as a key word there, when a lower court has developed a precedent. So a lower court has made a decision and the higher court then either on appeal or in a future case gets to review that either interpretation of a statute or review that decision and that ratio decidendi and then potentially make a different decision. Um, developing or avoiding precedent, it's important because it's now listed in the study design that we understand this concept of um, avoiding precedent because this is one of the ways that judges are able to make law even when maybe... Um, it appears that they can't. So when judges are deciding cases, judges don't just go off and start investigating the matter and coming up with their own ideas and figuring things out. We know cases are, we have an adversarial legal system. So judges will make decisions based on what the parties actually present to them. So the parties will present evidence and then arguments about their specific dispute. And as part of that, the arguments aspect of that, parties will actually be directing judges to consider previous precedents. Hey, there was this previous case where this happened. It's really similar to this one, so you have to do this. Now the party won't go, well, actually, it's not that similar. Here's something that is more similar, and as a result, you should make a decision that favours me. So that's what parties will actually be trying to do, and this is why one of the big aspects of, you know, doing law, um, if you guys go down that path, is doing all of your readings and learning about all of the different case law in areas like contracts, corporations, etc. So that if you're ever arguing a matter in court, you can be presenting to the judge and saying, hey, I want to reference this decision from a case in 2006, has similar facts to this one we're in now, so you should make the same decision. The judge then, once both parties have presented all of this, has to decide whether they will adopt the precedents that they've been presented or, or which one they will adopt depending on which one matches their situation the best or whether they maybe can avoid having to follow it. Maybe it's not a, maybe they don't think any of the precedents apply. It's a novel situation. Um, there are four ways that a judge can avoid having to follow precedent and they are, and this is the anagram that you might have seen before, rod. They are reverse the precedent overrule the precedent 
distinguish the precedent or disapprove the precedent. So reversing is when we're talking about actually the same case. So reversing and overruling are really, really similar. It's when a higher court makes a different decision than a lower court. So we'll see here. So a higher court makes a different decision than the lower court. Hey, this was the decision made by the lower court. It's obviously persuasive on the higher court. But the higher court goes, nah, you know what? I'm not going to follow that decision. I'm going to make a different decision. And as a result, that higher court creates a new precedent. So the higher court creates a new precedent. And as a result, the initial precedent no longer applies. Now, you'll see the slight difference here is that Reversing happens in the same case on appeal, whereas overruling happens in a different case. So, um, Dang v. Tirola, the studded belt, um, technically, again, the magistrate's court is not a superior court of record, so they're not creating a, um, a, a they're not creating common law so much. But the decision the magistrate made that a studded belt was a weapon, was a regulated weapon, that precedent. Um, the reasons for that decision were subsequently reversed by the Supreme Court because it was the same case being heard on appeal. That created a new precedent and the initial decision no longer applied. If um, in that case the young man who had been convicted of, um, or we didn't have a conviction recorded, but been found guilty of wearing the belt, if he didn't take the matter further and he just accepted it and moved on and lost his belt, but a year later, someone else was found guilty of wearing a belt with um, raised studs and they decided to appeal their matter um, up to the higher court. The higher court could overrule, the Supreme Court could make the decision that um, they made in the original De Young v. Tirola case um, and overrule that precedent and say, yep, yeah, the initial precedent no longer applies and from now on this new precedent is a studded belt is not a regulated weapon. A regulated weapon is... So that's the difference between reversing versus overruling, but there are ways that courts can avoid having to follow precedent. Um, really generally easy in this case because it's a higher court. So a higher court is only persuaded and then they create a new binding precedent for the courts lower. Distinguishing is where you get a different case again and this time the court decides, the judge decides that the facts of this case are different. So the facts of this case are sufficiently different that the precedent doesn't need to be applied. Now, what this means is a new precedent is created, but the two precedents now continue to exist because according to that judge, the facts are different. Now, hypothetical situation that you could think of here where distinguishing might occur is, um, you know, imagine you had a really vague and broad law, whether it's common law or statute law, that just said, um, you know, uh, restaurants have a responsibility or food service organisations have a responsibility to um, store food safely. And that's all it says. Um, and then one day a, a restaurant decides that the best way for them to thaw their frozen meat out, their frozen beef, for example, um, is to leave it on the kitchen bench overnight. So let it come up to temperature on the bench overnight and then cook it the next day. Now, maybe someone gets food poisoning, sues them, etc., and the court says, yep, yeah, leaving meat on a bench overnight is not storing food safely. And then that creates a precedent that, hey, if you leave meat on a bench overnight, it's not storing it safely. Um, subsequently, you know, breach of the law, um, liable. Maybe in the future, there's another case. And this time, rather than leaving the meat on the bench overnight, a restaurant decides they're going to leave the meat in a sink full of water, which is a way of defrosting meat. Um, and they're going to do that overnight as well. Someone gets food poisoning, whatever, sued. The judge has to decide, are those two cases similar enough? Do I apply the previous precedent where leaving meat out overnight is considered not storing it safely, even though it's been kept out overnight in different circumstances to the original leaving out overnight. 
And the judge then would have to say or would be able to say that, hey, these facts are materially different. Leaving in a sink in a sink of water is different to leaving it on a bench. And as a result, I'm not going to follow that previous precedent. And maybe they say, no, nah, that was fine. That's actually storing food safely. They shouldn't because it's not. Defrost your meat in the fridge, guys. Overnight in the fridge, that's the way to do it. Um, if you want to defrost it quickly in a sink full of water, but only you know for the few hours before you're going to use it, don't leave it there overnight. Um, that's an aside. This is just showing that a judge is able to, and this would be arguments from one of the parties. A judge is able to say, hey, my facts are slightly different. The case that I'm deciding on is slightly different to where this previous precedent was made. And as a result, I'm not going to follow it. And I'm going to say that that food was stored safely. So a judge is able to do that. You would think that that decision would then be appealed and then a higher court would get to decide. But that's just an example of judges saying, I don't want to follow a previous precedent because my case is different or materially different from that one that came before. The final aspect of rod is disapproving. And this is, again, a different case. So reversing is the only one where you have the same case. Um, disapproving is different to the other three because disapproving the precedent... is still followed. So this is where a judge is bound by a precedent, so generally, a, or a judge in a lower court. And they basically say, hey, I have to find this way because I have to follow precedent, but I don't agree with the decision that I'm making. And this can happen. A judge can disapprove. Hey, I have to find this way because the precedent says so, but I don't actually agree with the decision I'm making. What that is likely to do is that's likely to promote an appeal. It's likely to encourage the parties to take this to a higher court to eventually take it to a court that is no longer bound by the precedent. So take it to a higher court than where the original decision was made so that hopefully a judge can then overrule the previous precedent. Or um, sometimes disapproval can happen at a court on the same level. Um, and this is particularly in the High Court, where the High Court does not need to follow its previous precedent. So you don't need to follow precedents if you're on the same level. So the High Court doesn't need to follow its previous decisions, but ultimately the, the later decision or the newer decision by the High Court is probably the one that's likely to be followed by lower courts in the future. So that's disapproval. Our skill here, again, is discussed, but we know that that includes all those lower order skills as well, like explain, and we're going to get to discussing the ability of courts to make law um, in pretty much the next video. Um, so we would need to be able to address questions like, if we go back to the study design here, you know, we might get and explain the difference between binding precedent and persuasive precedent. We might get explain what disapproving of precedent is. Outline, you know, re the difference between reversing and overruling. So these are all things we could get as well as that more broadly, hey, discuss the ability of courts to make law. But we also need to remember that this skill is in every single area of study. You know, apply legal principles to hypothetical scenarios. And this is where this was a really good question from a bunch of years ago. Um, explain one reason why the County Court of Victoria may not be bound by a decision of the Supreme Court. So if we remember our court hierarchy, we would hopefully straight away go, hold on, the County Court's lower than the Supreme Court. So it would be bound, right? Like high, lower courts... You know, remember, lower courts are bound by the decisions of higher courts. It's a really important line to internalise in the same hierarchy, but really internalise that line. So explain one reason why the county court would not be bound, but lower courts are bound. Why would they not be bound by a decision of a higher court? And this is where you needed to apply rod particularly the first three letters of rod. Well, maybe the county court wouldn't be bound by the higher court if they could distinguish the facts of their case. And they could say, hey, this case is materially different, so I don't need to follow the previous decision. 
maybe the previous decision by the Supreme Court has subsequently in the future been overruled. Hey, there were future cases that came. That precedent's now been overruled. The county court is following a new precedent, not the precedent from that decision. Or maybe that decision made in the Supreme Court Court of Appeal was immediately appealed and uh, the Court of Appeal made a different decision. That created a new precedent. The precedent from this decision no longer exists and the county court doesn't have to therefore follow it. So these were the possible answers. The precedent has been reversed. The precedent has since been overruled or Parliament has abrogated, which we'll talk about in a future um, case. And you'll see the most common response was distinguishing, which isn't really explained, um, but these other two are. So I'd recommend having a read of that. You'll see kids really struggled with it because it was out of the box. Um, some students actually thought the county court was higher than the Supreme Court because this question fooled them. But you really needed to have a good understanding of rod, this idea that maybe that decision from the Supreme Court has subsequently been or was reversed on appeal. Maybe that decision from the Supreme Court has subsequently been overruled. So the county court doesn't need to follow it. It follows the new decision. Or maybe the county court was able to distinguish its matter from this previous Supreme Court decision and therefore they no longer need to follow it. They're no longer bound by that precedent. You know, disapproving couldn't be used because the county court, even if they didn't agree, would still actually have to follow it. And the question clearly says why they would not be bound. So even with disapproval, you're still bound to follow that decision even if you disapprove it. Um. I don't have a sample answer written for this, but, you know, just remembering that really important stemming of your answers, one reason why the county court would not have to follow the decision, da 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 da, da is if they can distinguish their case. And then you would explain, you know, distinguishing is. So explain what it means to distinguish. And then you would go, therefore, if the county court can show that, or if the county court sh believes that the facts of their matter or the judge in the county court believes the facts of their matter are different, they do not need to follow the decision. They are not bound by the decision of the higher. Um, that's the link I talked about earlier, and there's a nice little explanation of precedent, particularly binding and persuasive precedent from um, LawGov Poll, um, which is just a, a website of lots of different explanations of things. Um, ultimately, this should hopefully broaden and deepen your understanding of common law and the role courts may uh, play in lawmaking, and particularly deepen your understanding of how precedent operates in the Australian legal system. Um, happy studying and yeah, feel free to leave any feedback in the comments.